Earlier this season, we spoke with Meredith Black about the expanding role of design operations teams in helping companies scale their design practice. As far as founding figures in the world of design ops goes, it's hard to find a stronger candidate than Maria Judice. Maria founded Hot Studio in 1997, and after the studio was acquired in 2013 by Facebook, she spent the past five years as a design leader at tech companies, including both Facebook and Autodesk. In this episode, we ask Maria about how she approaches integrating design practices into an agile environment, some of the foundations a company needs to build a stronger design culture, and how her experience in founding and running a large studio helped her as a design leader in tech companies. So buckle your seatbelts and enjoy this episode with Maria. Also, quick note, there is some strong language in this episode, so if you're listening in the car or elsewhere with kids, you might want to save it for later. Okay, on to the show. I've worked with lots of search firms, both as a leader searching for new talent for my teams and as an individual exploring new steps in my career, but I trust none more than Wirt & Company. Since 1995, Wirt & Company has been the design community's most trusted search firm, co-founded by a designer and led by a CEO who has in-house operational startup experience. Wirt & Company is guided by the principle that creative leadership is essential to business success. They've helped some of the most admired brands from early stage startup to Fortune 500 build world-class creative teams. We're talking about companies like Airbnb, The New York Times, The Four Seasons, Notion, Figma, Google, Cartier, and Fair. Not bad. If you're looking for a partner to help you find the right person for a critical role, look no further than Wirt & Company. And if you're looking for your next design leadership role, Wirt & Company will guide you through the process as a friend and a champion throughout your journey. They take the time to get to know you, to understand what you need professionally and personally. Whether you're looking for your next role or your next team member, Wirt & Company can help you find a meaningful relationship. Visit wirtco.com to learn more and get in touch. That's W-E-R-T-C-O dot com. Support for Design Better comes from Gusto, who make running a small business easy. Get three months free at gusto.com slash design better once you run your first payroll. Running a small business is hard work, especially all of the payroll, quarterly tax filing stuff, and HR things. I'd rather be focused on my business and my customers than dealing with the administrative duties. But Gusto makes it easy. They automate the complicated parts of running a business. With Gusto, I never miss federal or state payroll tax filings. And I love the time off requests and time tracking tools. Gusto even offers a small group health insurance option for nearly any budget. When you run into issues you need help with, their HR experts are ready to help. It's a very well-designed product, easy to use, and great emotional design that will put a smile on your face. Design Better listeners get three months free once they run their first payroll. Just go to gusto.com slash design better. That's gusto.com slash design better. Maria Judice, design leader and co-author of Rise of the DEO, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. We are so very excited to have you. Um, you have a long and storied history in, in the world of design. And we wanted to start off just uh, talking a little bit about your story, uh, founding Hot Studio, and then spending five years as a design leader at, at tech companies like mm -hmm. Facebook and Autodesk. And how, how did your experience in founding that large studio help you in your roles there at mm. Facebook and Autodesk? Well, one of the things I, I uh, tell people, especially people who are coming up in design, that um, as they embark on this you know, career in design, it's going to be really important to work in a variety of contexts. You should uh, spend some time working in an agency, a small agency, a large agency, a startup environment a giant corporation, because when you have that sort of worldview of what design can offer and how people can work together in different contexts, you can learn things from each of those uh, environments that are gonna make you a better designer overall. So I think my agency upbringing and taking that into giant corporations was incredibly helpful, um, especially when it comes to getting things done. Because when you're in an agency, you are time and materials. You, you, you have no time to waste. Uh, time is money. And taking that kind of sense of urgency inside a company that is shipping products 
on a regular basis, it really it gives you a, a bit of an edge in terms of um, being able to ship products uh, at scale and quickly. Maria, talk to us about that um, transition. So running Hot Studio for more than a decade and working yep. on some pretty amazing stuff, amazing people that you had in your studio, uh, people who have been on this podcast like Meredith Black uh, used to work at Hot Studio. What was that transition like? You know, it's, it's one thing to say, you know, it's, it's important to have this breadth of, of experiences, but those transitions, they can be scary. Oh, yeah. So what was it like to go from Hot Studio to Facebook? It was incredibly painful for me. Um, I, and um, like starting a business, I completely underestimated how hard it was going to be. I mean, I kind of jump into everything with a bit of a na naivete and say, oh, how hard can this be? I remember when I had my first child, Max, and I was running Hot Studio and the company was growing. And there were like 20 people at Hot Studio, huge company back then. And I was pregnant and I was like, oh, I totally have this. One baby, I run a company and it, I completely underestimated how, uh, how much of a life change that was. Same going from being in an agency to suddenly going inside a large corporation where you are not sort of the, uh, the king or the, qu the queen. You don't make all the decisions. You have to collaborate with peers. Um, you always have a client. So I didn't have any problems managing and working for a boss, but working with peers was really, really hard for me. And also going into an environment like Facebook where the average age at Facebook when I joined was 25 years old, including you know Mark Zuckerberg. And I'm 50, I was 50 at the time. So having that, uh, experience of suddenly being a senior leader who has a, a solid reputation in a company, going into a, a, a company like Facebook where these 20, 25 year olds had no idea of my history. It was really, really hard, a, a wake up call for me that um, suddenly I was kind of just like everybody else. How did that, um, you know, during that transition, when you're used to being in this agency world and obviously the partnerships you have there are of one type and then coming to a different role at Facebook, what, what, what were the partnerships there like? What was the difference and what were the ways that you approached those relationships? In many ways, working with cross-functional teams was super easy because when you work in an agency, you are working with clients, you're working with developers, you're working with content people, um, and, and that, that nucleus of um, a multidisciplinary team was incredibly familiar to me. Uh, it was much harder working with my peers and trying to understand what the guardrails were. Be, what, how, how do we navigate the relationship between peers? Is it collaborative? Is it competitive? The, the thing about corporations that I've come to learn over the the last five years that really surprised me is there's a lot of competition uh, inside corporations that do that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to ship a better product. Um, people are, you know, always looking and seeing how they're going to be upwardly mobile. Um, who's going to take credit for what? Uh, there's a ton of politics in giant corporations that I frankly was not really prepared for. And something I did learn about myself is, uh, which I suspected was gonna be the issue, I suck at politics. <laughs> I am such a straight shooter. I totally suck. I'm terrible at the nuance of politics. I'm one of those people like, you got something to do? Let's get together, let's figure it out. We're gonna go in together, we're gonna, we're gonna solve this. Um, we're all gonna celebrate. But inside company uh, politics, it's like, who takes credit for what? Who's reporting to who? Um, uh, who's gonna get a promotion? Who's not? Uh, there's this thing called being stack ranked, which is sucks as an idea, where you are ranked against everybody else and that's how you get promoted and you get, you get um, bonuses. 
So there's all of these things that are inside these companies that prevent you from actually just doing good work sometimes. So that transition um, was hard for me. Uh, and I think I, I learned the hard way at Facebook. And then by the time I got to Autodesk, I was prepared to understand how to navigate the political waters of a large corporation. So uh, clearly there's a lot of complexity in these big organizations. Um, it, what we see is um, product companies are learning a lot from agencies. Mm -hmm. um, the hustle, the can-do attitude. Uh, and I'm curious to hear what you learned from product companies. Mm -hmm. So yes, there are things mm -hmm. that are more challenging. Yep. Yes, there are politics and people things. But chances are, I think you probably learned ton in those years at Facebook and Autodesk that could potentially inform work in the agency world. Uh, oh. Are there lessons you bring back? Oh, yes. Like I said, it's like even though I had a hard time transitioning into corporate America, I learned so much over these last five years, both at Facebook and at Autodesk. Uh, first of all, the impact of shipping at scale is amazing. Like when you're in an agency, you don't have that insight. You don't get to really see how your work plays out over time. You don't get to change and pivot uh, over a, a period of time and really understand the impact on people and on the product itself. Um, and so like at Facebook, I just remember this, I was working on what is now called Facebook Marketplace. This was the early days of Facebook marketplace. And I remember we were, you know, testing out this uh, design. And my boss at the time, Mike Grinnell, was like, okay, we're going to test this to 1% of the population. This is one of the great things about being at a company like Facebook, where you can say, I have an idea, we're going to test it out, and we're going to respond to, you know, what, from, you know, from this test. And it's a live test. He said, we're going to only do 1% of the population. Well, it's one, like 10 million people. <laughs> it is the what 1% of the population at Facebook was the country of New Zealand. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> now, New Zealand gets a lot of new products because it's this, you know, it's this contained island. And there was a lot of Facebook penetration. But that was amazing that you can actually, you know, test, uh, you know, a, a large group of people and then iterate over time. The other thing that was amazing at Facebook was using data science as a design tool. Like Facebook has hands down the smartest people I have ever met in my entire life. Uh, you know, having imposter syndrome is a regular thing at Facebook and everybody has imposter syndrome and everybody there is wicked brilliant. Um, but like having a data scientist as part of the design team where they actually can look at the data and find patterns that you normally can't see and they bring that to the forefront and you could use that as a design tool. That was amazing. Um, uh, uh, you know, and I learned a lot how to, how to you know, combine design insight, traditional design process, but also looking at the data and coming up with insights through that mechanism as well. Um, so tons of lessons. And then at Autodesk, I learned, my job was different at Autodesk. I was the vice president of experience design there. So I was at the top uh, of, the, of the food chain as a designer there, but learning how to lead through influence, not necessarily authority, when there are 400 designers worldwide that they don't necessarily report to you. How do you, how do you create systems? How do you inspire people uh, a, a, a around the world? How do you uh, rally around a common vision? It was another, uh, a, tons of lessons there. Um, which are going to help me for whatever next move I make. Okay, so I got to follow up with you about the, the common vision piece because 
this is one of those pitfalls for design teams operating at scale. And it's not just a design team thing. It's actually just you get a whole bunch of people trying to do something in, in some sort of uh, you know, collaborative environment. They have to have a shared vision to be able to um, execute and, yeah. and not just have chaos. So what does that look like at Facebook or at Autodesk? How do you create that shared vision to bring people together? Mm. Well, you bring up a really good point about shared vision, right? Because it sounds it sounds easy, but it's completely not. Uh, especially in companies like Facebook and Auto, Autodesk, where there are really, really strong uh, barriers and silos. And kind of coming back full circle, where I say uh, some of the challenges of working across a company where people have their own fiefdoms, they have to agree to a common vision, right? There's no mandate. So how those peers work together and how much they're willing to share the power will lead to the ability to have a common shared vision. There has to be agreements at that leadership level in order for... Um, teams to adopt a shared vision. If you don't have leaders that agree, you're never going to have shared visions and you're going to have these strong silos where everybody has their own vision um, or flavors of a vision, which mm -hmm. make it even hard to have clarity in terms of what you're shooting for um, over time. Uh, there's you know, ways to uh, communicate a shared vision. There's ways to inspire people uh, but again, that's through influence, not necessarily authority in these large organizations. So this, this, um, that, that's wonderful. I'm, uh, and it really resonates with a lot of the things that we hear from the companies we talk to. And I wanted to kind of flip the other question Aaron had around and, and, you know, you had these learnings from these large companies, but also you, you brought a lot from your from your role running Hot Studio into places like Facebook. And one of the things, you know, we've talked to Meredith Black, as we mentioned, and one of the things that the agency world seemed to bring to design at scale is this role of a producer. Yep. Could you talk a little bit about that, um, mm -hmm. the origins of design ops? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny now that it has a name. Um, it, you know, <laughs> I had just a sidebar, you know, when I was starting out, there was no such thing as UX either. You know, everybody was calling it all sorts of things. So now Design Ops has a fancy name. It, it, it makes me laugh uh, because it's things that people have been doing for years and years and years. But when I got to Facebook, there, was no, there weren't any producers. So um, we brought producers into Facebook for the first time. And this idea of a program manager where, you know, designers were kind of left on their own to figure things out. They were, they, were mem they were members of a team, but there was no sort of collective culture, collective community. This was true at, at Autodesk as well, where big companies want design, but they don't know how to manage them. They don't know how to organize them. And when we got to Facebook, it was sort of the same way. And we had to really fight and advocate for producers and program managers um, at, at Facebook. So I had hired, when I w joined Facebook uh, on my team, I hired one of the first program managers, helped write the job description. Now they're pervasive through Facebook, they're necessary. Uh, but it's a pretty we, sizable team too. It's roughly 50, 60 people now. So that's, that's a pretty yeah. big operation. And, and big, companies, tech companies, they had technical program managers, but they never thought that designers needed program managers as well. So now they're really, really critical in large companies. Um, and they now fly under the banner of design ops. But design ops, you know, as when you have design, um, you have a large amount of designers and growing in these companies, they ha you have to kind of put culture in place. You have to uh, create processes and systems and rules that everybody can abide by. You have to decide 
what tools you're going to adopt. Because as you know, tools are constantly changing and, um, you know, you want everybody to be using the same tools so they can share files and um, have a common understanding of how things are built. And, you know, so the role of the producer is not only to get shit done, to, you know, keep people on track, but it's also to put forth the culture and define the vision uh, that, uh, the design vision that's inside these uh, organizations and to unify the design force in a way so that they can feel empowered. Many of these tech companies that are hiring designers, they just, they're, I always say they're kind of hidden on the bowels of the scrum team. And it was like that at Autodesk. It was like all of, they have 400 designers around the world, but they never had a, a design leader to bring everybody together. They were kind of, uh, unempowered because they were really looked at as wireframe monkeys in a lot of ways, you know, like pump out some wireframes and I'll, uh, I'll uh, code it up and, and we'll ship it like that. Or design happened at the end of the process instead of the beginning of the process. So uh, design ops adds a legitimacy and adds a power uh, uh, inside these companies um, so that designers can kind of step up and be leaders instead of followers. I think it's important for our listeners to also know the role that you and Hot Studio played in shaping design ops, because you're right, design ops is, is a, a very big, um, it, it's a milestone for the design industry that it it's represents uh, maturity to practice, um, not just inside of the design team, but aligning to the broader business, um, which is which is key to yeah. having design be valued and invested in. But what's, what's interesting to us is that Hot Studio, uh, bringing this idea and these roles into Facebook, Courtney Kaplan is still there and mm -hmm. she was working with you. Yep. Uh, Meredith Black was with you and she left and, and started design operations at Pinterest. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, it's it's interesting that that this this origin story of design ops. Now, design ops is, has happened in, in other places as well, but um, fascinating to see the role that you and your team at Hot Studio has played in shaping that in the Bay Area Valley um, and in mm -hmm. the industry. Yeah, well, it's I am incredibly proud of Hot Studio's reach, and I, I tell all my former employees that I will uh, be taking credit for them for the rest of their lives. If they've worked at Hot Studio, I am responsible for their success for the rest of their <laughs> lives. Um, but there's, yeah, so there's two things that I am I think Hot Studio had positive impacts across the industry. Well, there's probably three. Um, Hot Studio was known for um, its, you know, high bar of quality, you know, and by the way, uh, interesting point, you may not know this, but the Hot Studio website is still up. So if you oh, go, that actually yes, if you, <laughs> that's right. So it's like, it's frozen in time, but it is still up and you can kind of go and see the work that we did and some of the videos and old, um, you know, old talks that we've given there. But Hot Studio was known for incredibly high design quality. We had a, we had a really high bar, but um, how it applies to uh, its impact inside companies, it was really known for its culture, that design, um, you know, we had an incredibly positive, optimistic design culture that was incredibly diverse. So at Hot Studio, we had 50% women, 50% men. Um, you know, from the very beginning. We were one of the most uh, gender, uh, 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 culturally diverse companies probably across the country. And uh, I'm really proud of that diversity. Um, and that, but the culture really brought, you know, this idea of, you know, building a positive culture inside a company, 
with strong work ethic, with strong process, um, with strong um, appreciation for innovation and ideas. And that really trickled into Facebook. And I feel like it's trickled into uh, companies across the US because so many of Hot Studio alum are, are spread out um, all over the country. Um, so, and you know what? I, I also want to give a shout out to IDEO because I do feel like um, I've always looked at IDEO as a model. Uh, and I'm really impressed with IDEO's ability to bring design into business as well. So, you know, even though I'm really proud of Hot Studio's achievements, I do want to, it's always important to look at those people, those companies that, that, you, that inspire you and take a lesson and a page out of, the, uh, of their playbook. Um, so I feel like I've taken a lot out of IDEO's ideas and I then, you know, made it my own through Hot Studio. I could pass that on to Dave Kelly because I'd have office hours near his office. Oh, um, you do? Yeah. So he, he would uh, really, I'm sure, appreciate that compliment. Um, Dave Kelly and Tim Brown have been incredible mentors to me personally. And I'll tell you a funny story about that. Um, so when I was running Hot Studio, and, I, and Hot Studio, you know, lasted uh, over 15 years, um, and I would always tell my employees, uh, I'm not going to be 80 years old and run Hot Studio. Um, and someday I'm either going to sell the company or I'm not. And um, when I was, you know, through the course of Hot Studio's, um, you know, longevity, I would meet with David, I would meet with Tim on a regular basis because, you know, the thing about agencies is the ups and downs of the economy really have impact on the success and health of an agency. You really have to ride that wave. And whenever things are bad, a lot of leaders get together and drink heavily um, <laughs> and hope that we survive another day. And I would meet with Tim on occasion and I was telling him, you know, um, I'm going to be 50 in a couple of years and I'm really thinking about what's next for me and I don't and I and I'm really concerned and proud of the legacy of Hot Studio but I don't know if I want to continue to do this for the rest of my life. And Tim was like you are doing admirable work. Hot Studio is an amazing company. It's so critically important that Hot Studio is alive and well. You're doing great, great work. But you should go talk to David Kelly. And so I said, okay. So I went and I met with David Kelly and I said the same thing to David. I said, you know, I've been running Hot Studio a long time. I don't know, I, want, I might wanna do something different. Uh, you know, I've survived three different downturns. It's not really fun. Um, I also saw the writing on the wall with big companies taking your talent. You're only as good as your talent when you're in a design agency. And so I don't know what to do. You know, should I just keep on hanging in there? And David's like, Maria, sell the company. <laughs> <laughs> so Tim's <laughs> telling me, Tim's telling me, hold on to your company. David's like, you selling Hot Studio is a bigger move than keeping it. He said, you're a woman leader. That's a big, big deal. A hot studio to be sold for a lot of money, that's a big deal. That's really putting a stake in the ground that design has value. Selling your company is the best thing that you can do for the future of design and for yourself. And so, you know, they have given me those kind of guidances. So I remember that moment where David Kelly was like, yeah, you know, it, it, you know don't feel bad about these design companies that are being bought and sold by these large companies. It just underscores the value that we have, that design has arrived and that the people are worth quite a lot of money for these big companies because they bring the ingenuity, they bring the innovation, um, they make their products better. And uh, so we should be very proud of seeing all these companies getting acquired. Um, it's not like they're gonna disappear. New ones will pop up and, and they, will, they will take the place of the hot studios and the sequences and 
all the other, and the tein and laxes, new ones will pop up and, and they will um, have the opportunity to grow. That's a great story. A related question there. Um, so not everybody can, is able to acquire a hot studio <laughs> and yeah. get, that, get that cultural, you know, that design cultural kind of foundation. What are you, what would you say to a company that's, you know, kind of maybe struggling a little bit to build that kind of culture? Is there something that they can do to kind of reinforce their own foundation for a design culture? Yeah, I mean, I think the, <laughs> um, you know what? It really helps growing up Italian. <laughs> maybe, maybe they need to hire more Italians. Because, you know, it's like you you have to grow a company and treat it as if it's it's not a family, but you have to treat it as if it's people that you care about and you love and you want to see successful and you want to grow. Any company starts with people. And if people are super happy and they are feeling heard and they're valued, that's where the seeds of great culture begin. And it starts with what I consider and what I think is important is the servant leader. I always said that my job is to hire people much smarter and better than me. And my job is to be in service to the people who work for me. I was always so grateful when people joined Hot Studio. Um, you know, it was like, wow, because I, I looked at it as a, a contract. Like it was, it was my responsibility. If somebody was to work for Hot Studio, it was my responsibility to help them become better versions of themselves. It was my responsibility to make sure that they had healthy wages so they can support their family. It was my responsibility that they had healthy work-life balances. And we did a lot of things at Hot Studio to ensure that people had healthy work-life balances. It's my responsibility that I paid them on time every two weeks. So I took that responsibility incredibly seriously. It was my responsibility to create a culture where they can do their best work. In return, I expect them to give me their best work of their lives, to, to really care about the work, care about the clients, not phone it in, not be boring. Um, and so that was the... That was the contract, ex that was the exchange that we had at Hot Studio. And, um, you know, I, I think that, that it paid off. But, uh, you know, and then those people grow up to be great leaders. And I hope that they have the same I attitude about what it means to lead a company. Um, and, you know, these these kinds of ways of leading transcend design. You know, you can, it doesn't have to be a design culture. It could be an engineering culture. It could be a content culture. Um, it's about really treating people uh, right and making sure that they love to come to work every day. Support for Design Better comes from Uplift Desk, who help you work better and live healthier. Eli and I log a lot of hours at our desks, which can be detrimental to one's health if you're not paying attention to ergonomics. Uplift Desk offer high-quality, well-designed desks, chairs, and accessories to help you build an ergonomic workspace for home or work. Eli recently got a standing desk, and I got a human-scale freedom chair. I've been dreaming about this chair for a long time, and I finally got one. I've already noticed a big change in my posture with this chair, and my body thanks me for it. Eli is logging a lot more hours standing and sitting these days, and he can make quick transitions with the flip of a switch. We love Uplift Desk, and we know that you will too. Design Better listeners can get a special deal by visiting upliftdesk.com and use the code DESIGNBETTER at checkout for 5% off your order. You'll get free shipping, free returns, and an industry-leading 15-year warranty. Go to upliftdesk.com, use code DESIGNBETTER, and get 5% off. Design a better workspace with Uplift Desk. Support for Design Better comes from Gusto, who make running a small business easy. Get three months free at gusto.com slash design better once you run your first payroll. Running a small business is hard work, especially all of the payroll, quarterly tax filing stuff, and HR things. 
I'd rather be focused on my business and my customers than dealing with the administrative duties. But Gusto makes it easy. They automate the complicated parts of running a business. With Gusto, I never miss federal or state payroll tax filings, and I love the time off requests and time tracking tools. Gusto even offers a small group health insurance option for nearly any budget. When you run into issues you need help with, their HR experts are ready to help. It's a very well-designed product, easy to use, and great emotional design that will put a smile on your face. Design Better listeners get three months free once they run their first payroll. Just go to gusto.com slash design better. That's gusto.com slash design better. Support for Design Better comes from Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery. Design Better listeners can save 50% on their order at factormeals.com slash designbetter50. Use the code designbetter50. You know what happens at my house when things get really busy? In the evenings, we turn to takeout, which can be expensive and it's not very good for our health. Lately, we're making a better choice at crunch time. We turn to Factor for chef created, dietitian approved meals that are ready to eat in just two minutes. We like the flexibility of Factor too. You can change your order up every week with plans from four to 18 meals per week, or you can pause or reschedule your deliveries at any time. The meals are so tasty. My wife and I are huge fans. And I like their smoothies, too, which I find are perfect for a quick, healthy breakfast. Factor can help you eat well and feel good while focusing on your career and your family. Head to factormeals.com slash designbetter50 and use the code designbetter50 to get 50% off your order. That's code designbetter50 at factormeals.com slash designbetter50 to get half off your order. One thing that we've heard a lot from uh, design teams is that they they struggle to do good work in an agile environment mm-hmm. where you know they're in cross functional teams. Um, agile, which is a methodology that does not mm-hmm. I- in the manifesto, it does not describe the designer whatsoever in the design process. That's absent. And yet designers yeah. are trying to find a way to to fit into that process because it is, you know, uh, it, it's, a, it's a big part of how a lot of companies operate. How did you navigate that in your yeah. experience? Well, God, you know, I gave a talk a zillion years ago when we started, uh, when the whole idea of Agile uh, was uh, becoming popular. Um, and it really felt like, I remember that when we started working with development teams in the early days of Hot Studio, uh, and we had to fit into their process, it felt like designers were constantly running behind a moving train. <laughs> That's what it feels like, right? That env- the engineering team needs to go, and you are working like hell to try to get ahead of that train so that you can do good thinking before you actually deliver something, a piece of code, a piece of a feature to keep um, an engine, engineering team going and running uh, and not idle. And the, the, the trick is good planning. So, uh, and this, was, this is, this is going to be, it is still a constant struggle. Uh, I actually thought Facebook did a great job um, because they didn't, they weren't so beholden to the timeline. You know, so many of these teams that practice Agile, they're not flexible enough. They're like, okay, we're going to, you know, we have a user story and we're going to ship in two weeks and every two weeks we're going to ship and you just have to fit into that process. At Facebook, it was like working with uh, developers and saying, what do you need in order to be delivering strong prototypes that were informed by, by, uh, by user research? And, you know, do you have to do upfront research? Are we going to live test it? What is the strategy? It was a conversation to have with the team to determine what is needed in order to deliver a good result. And designers, really, a healthy team needs to understand the trade-offs of getting something to market, but understanding what is going to be required in terms of good thinking and good due diligence before it actually goes out the door. So I think that 
uh, the idea of Agile is abused by militant people who believe that it's a religion when it's not. It's really a guidance. It's a, it's a way of working. And, um, you know, oftentimes you just have to figure out how do designers get ahead? Of how, can they be a couple of cycles ahead, um, ahead of the moving train so that they don't feel like they have to be reactive when they're working with teams uh, in the moment. So I really think that you're right. Agile was not uh, developed with design in mind, but we as designers can um, uh, impact that process and bring our own processes in place to integrate it. And I, and I call it human-centered Agile. You can do a combo um, there's things called, there's like a phase zero, which is really like a two, you can do a, a, a sprint cycle ahead where it's only about design and research. So by the time you're ready to actually build, you've done, you've done, you're, you've been ahead of the, the game. So, you know, it's, it's agile's here to stay, but there's ways in which that you can work with teams so that both parties are successful because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter about being a designer or an engineer or a data science. It's did we ship a great product together? So to that point, um, maybe you could talk a little bit about organizational design and how that relates to um, setting up these teams in a way that's more functional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, there's a great book called Org Design for Design Orgs. I'm sure everybody cites that as a good resource. Um, I love the title. <laughs> um, but uh, they do a really good job explaining uh, the different ways uh, design teams get organized in, in, these, um, in giant companies or even startups. So there's, and there's trade-offs for all ways of organizing. There's no magic bullet. There are trade-offs for each one of these. So the very first one is this idea of design being centralized. So you have a head of design and, and everybody reports into this head of design um, and you're almost like a service organization uh, servicing uh, design um, product teams. I think it adds a strong cultural connection to design, but it creates its own silos, and it doesn't create that trust, that bond, that uh, uh, the collaborative spirit when, when design is sort of segregated in its own area um, away from engineering and product management. Um, but if you have a small company, that might be a good starting point it's important to build that strong design culture and designers need to work together. The second one is the design teams just report up into uh, product teams and there's no design leader. And that, that creates that, um, what I was calling the bowels of the scrum team, that creates no culture, is that designers are basically um, implementers and there, you're gonna have an unevenness of quality because there's no common vision, there's no design principles that glue people together. But you move awfully fast, right? Because there's nobody, you're, you're, you're embedded and you're in your own bubble and you may not necessarily understand how your bubble is contextually related to other bubbles, but you can ship. And then the third one is the hybrid approach, which I really um, uh, believe in, which is you have a leader of design, like a VP, and that VP has directors that uh, report in to um, that VP. So the directors are like that peer group, which I was talking about earlier, where you can actually manage a peer group of people and and kind of enforce a common vision, enforce an overall structure, put the re rules in place, make sure that they're collaborating and not living within their own silos. And then designers report up to those directors, but they also dotted line to the 
to the product um, silos, the product uh, orgs. So that creates allegiance to the products and to the design team. Um, and so I think this hybrid model is important, but it does create very blurry lines in terms of, okay, you know, um, do, I, do I listen to the uh, product leader, the product owner, or do I listen to the design leader? And that's where negotiation comes in. That's where trust comes in. Um, you know, when you when the benefit of silos is you can control. When you have blurry lines, it requires a lot of um, sharing of power. But if you can have really good relationships, that's when it really works. Maria, you've worked on so many different things um, in your career. What are you really passionate about today? Here's what I'm really passionate about right now: diversity. I am Let's talk so. About that. Let's talk about diversity. I, this is the thing that it is I'm in more on fire about than ever before because one of the things, see, going to Facebook, and, and you look at all of the shit that's going on right now, right, which is good. It's good that it has come to a head. But this idea of um, technology for harm, it, it, and, and I really think, it, uh, and I have seen this, uh, at Facebook and elsewhere, we're so fucking optimistic about technology. Now, it's really important to be, to be all in on technology and really excited about all, all the things that are happening with AI and, and um, all, all of the, uh, you know, data, collecting data to create better product experiences. I'm all in on, on that. But the issue that I saw when I was at Facebook was this naivete about technology. Um, and so you look at you know, how Facebook has swayed the election. Now, I, I have tremendous respect for Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg and all the people at Facebook. And being at Facebook at that time, it, you, you are riding this wave. You are, you are you're feeling like you're doing great things in the world but you are not at all thinking about people doing bad things and, and uh, being well, evil. Well, it's too much for one human to hold in their mind. And that's, that's the bottleneck. Well, it's not just that. This is, a, this is a problem with moving fast. When you move fast, and this is true, no matter you're at Facebook or at a startup right now, because right now I'm consulting startups, and I tell them, it's important for you to ship but don't be obsessed with it because you are going to cut corners and you're not going to be thinking about all of the negative outcomes of the decisions that you're making. You're constantly, because you're moving so fast, you're always thinking about the ideal scenario. You are not thinking about unintended consequences. You are not thinking about bad actors. So be, because you're moving so fast, and, and uh, in startup worlds and cor corporations, you, you don't have the time to really think about all sides of the problem you're trying to solve. You're constantly thinking about the ideal scenario. And, and so when I was at Facebook, people had just had this naivete because they were moving so fast. They never thought about unintended consequences. They never thought about bad actors. So what's so important here is um, I, I, I feel like the reason, part of the reason is not just the speed, it's life experience. When you're in your 20s, you really don't, you didn't have, you didn't have the rest of your life to, to understand the bumps in the road. You are constantly moving in this like, I remember when I was 20. I was like straight shooting. I was like, the world is my oyster. Nothing can go wrong. When you're in your 40s and 50s, you've been around the block enough times to know that there are going to be bumps in the road, that there are going to be bad people who are going to do bad things. Stuff and, happens. And so part of this, uh, this thing that has happened is, first of all, now we have to start thinking about bad actors as personas. That's a data, that's a sort of process point. 
But this thing about having a diversity of people working on solving a problem, it's not just about gender, it's not just about sexuality, it's about age, it's um, people with disabilities, making sure that we're not designing uh, to exclude people. So this, you know, as we think about the future workforce, as we think about small teams, large teams, corporations, it, it's bullshit when we say, oh, we've gotten like 4% African-American and 20% women. That's fucking bullshit. Why don't we, why don't you hire people, and I know it's going to take longer, but let's hire people who reflect the world population. If we're going to be designing products and services for people around the world globally, then we need to make sure that we have people designing products that reflect the world. And, uh, you know, we at least have to have 50, 50, 50 percent women um, and people of all different kind of cultural backgrounds. And then we're going to get to great product design. So we have to invest and we have to support early education. We have to invest in middle school. We have to get people excited about the work that we do, not just developers, but designers. We have to bring art back into school because they have, people have no idea, especially people of color, they have no idea that they could have careers in design and make a shitload of money. So I love to go into underserved communities and tell my story about being, you know, a, a, a woman growing up in Staten Island, you know, who went to public school and went to art school despite what their parent their parents wanted them me to do, and I wound up getting a fine art degree, becoming a graphic designer, creating a company, and then selling my company to Facebook. Now, anybody can do this. You know, and, uh, and, and this is why we have to be investing in diversity much early on. And enough with these companies that don't have uh, good uh, diversity representation at the highest levels. And I'm just really tired of people going, oh, we got like 15% women. That's fucking bullshit because we're 50% of the population. So people have to work a lot harder to get the diversity in their own companies so that we can create incredible product experiences that everybody could use. And Maria, this is, this is a, a serious passion project for you. Um, can you talk a bit about CEO and what you're doing there? This, I mean, it's a fascinating model. Yeah. Well, um, she, I am just an investor for CEO. Um, uh, and I'm not really actively involved in CEO, but the idea of CEO is you pay a thousand dollars, and the, I think they're trying to get they got what um, was it five hundred or half a million? Yeah, half a million. The idea is to get a shitload of women to invest a small amount of money and create a fund to support women-owned businesses. And, uh, you know, they call it radical generosity. And then they created a whole support network so that uh, they can invest in women-led ventures. And if anybody is following C uh, Cindy Gallup, who's, who's, who's been, um, has been talking about this and advocating on, uh, on behalf of women entrepreneurs for years, Women entrepreneurs do not get funded at the rate, the same rate that men do. Big surprise there. So uh, women are starting to, um, you know, em empower themselves, are starting to use their own strength, their own revenue to um, sort of fight the system um, until we can kind of get to this idea that people can't see uh, sex and gender, and that ideas will be funded based on the good ideas, um, and everybody's treated equally, companies like CEO are really, really important. Um, 
So I'm just an investor. I'm not actively in the organization. I'm much more active with this nonprofit that I support called Interact Project that I'm hoping to get to scale. So hopefully there's some uh, uh, radical, radically generous people listening to this broadcast. But Interact Project uh, is this scrappy uh, nonprofit based in the Bay Area who goes into underserved communities and teaches kids design uh, from awareness to entrepreneurialism. And is the goal is to help develop a pipeline, um, create this awareness that you can have design careers early on, starting in middle school, uh, and create classes so that kids could have pipelines into um, art schools, uh, taking art classes in community colleges, um, or um, you know, start developing a career in product design and getting into giant companies uh, so that we can create that diversity that we so desperately need right now. So this is really investing in the long term. And uh, so if anybody is interested, go to Interact Project and donate. Um, and I would love to see that program get to scale across the company so that we can really accelerate the diversity that's needed um, upstream inside companies. That's interactproject.org, right? It that's looks like correct. there's also volunteer opportunities yes. as well. Yes. So people can volunteer uh, and 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 you know bring interact to their own to their own communities. That's great. Some of my uh, alumni students from my program have been helping out there. Um, that's awesome. As leads. So yeah, it seems like a really great project. Yeah. Well, that's great. And thank you so much for the time and, and for being on the show. And we'll certainly share out uh, links to, to interact and also to CEO. And um, yeah, so it was wonderful having you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.